Well, it is, uh, it is good to be here today. It is good to be back, uh, back home with you guys. Sherry and I have definitely missed you all. Uh, we have been out of town for several weeks now and um, might not be that long on the calendar, but man, it has felt like months. And so uh, we are very grateful to be back. It's good to see everybody. It's good to get to hug everybody. Um, just very, very grateful. I uh, see a lot of visitors today. I want to welcome you to New Life Community Church and echo what James has already said. We're glad that you're here today too. Um, just make yourselves at home. We hope you enjoy the service. And so my name is Jasper. Uh, I'm the associate pastor here. Um, not a very good one because you don't have bulletins today. So you guys need to find somebody better, I guess. Um, I'm sorry, we're out of ink. And so because we're out of ink, I also didn't print my sermon. It's on a computer. So forgive me for this. I know I'm short. You might not even see me over the screen here, but I'm going to move around some. How about that? You guys can watch Josh try to follow me with the, the camera. So <laughs> drive him crazy today. So anyway, it's good to be back. Good to see you guys. Um, hopefully within the next few weeks, we'll be home for good. Uh, things are going great. Uh, so we're right on track. We should be back by the end of the month and looking forward to that. So be sure to uh, hug Sherry. <laughs> anyway, all right. So let's, uh, let's get rolling with this. Um, for those of you maybe who are visiting or don't know, we've been working through the book of James uh, on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights in our home groups. And so uh, just to give you a really, really quick snapshot into the book of James as a whole and kind of some context that will play a part in what we're going to talk about today. The book of James was written by a guy named James, and uh, it is a, a very short book that is just packed full of practical application for Christians, okay? So it's not a book that's full of just a lot of real heady, theological, just thoughts and stuff. It's, it's real down, down to earth, boots on the ground. This is how you should live as Christians, okay? So it's a lot of application. It's a lot of that. So the book of James is known for verses like, uh, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. Actually do what it's saying. Uh, it's also known for what we're going to get into next week, that faith without works is dead. And so we're, we're, we're covering some big, big passages like that. Today is no different. It's a passage that is very practical in its application. Uh, it's just very simple stuff. It's not anything too complicated. So if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 2. Now, the book of James also was written to Christians who were dispersed at the time. Uh, James opens the letter by saying, Greetings to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Okay, so there was a guy named uh, Herod Agrippa I who was persecuting Christians. They were dispersed everywhere and they were meeting in house churches, probably, you know, underground churches. They were having to kind of hide and be sneaky about it. So they're just kind of spread out everywhere. And so he's writing this letter to these Christians and to these churches about just very practical things. So these were, would have been Jewish Christians that he was writing to. And so he addresses them as brothers throughout this letter and gives them all kinds of great instruction. Now, uh, if you are able, please stand. Uh, you don't have to if you can't, but if you are able, let's stand. And we're going to read James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So, speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we have it, that we can read it. And I I thank you uh, for everything that is contained in it. And God, I just pray this morning that as we talk through this and we think through James chapter 2, that you just help us to process this. I pray that you speak to us through the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you help us to hide these truths in our heart and apply it to our everyday lives. We give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Okay, so James does what any good pastor does. And right out of the gate, he he has this format for how he's going to do this. He tells them the topic, and then he gives an example, and then he gets right down to the root and his main point, and then he supports it with Scripture and things that the Bible teaches. So it's a great sermon layout. And so we're just going to kind of follow through that today. So right out of the gate, he tells them what the issue is. In verse 1, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And then he launches into this example. So personal favoritism, another way of saying this in some of your translations, I think the ESV says partiality. So showing partiality, playing favorites, having bias amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ within your church. Now apparently this was, this was an issue for these churches. And we know that this is not the only time that this is in Scripture, right? There there are other examples of this. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 8, Paul says this, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages according to his labor. So James was actually written before 1 Corinthians, even though that's not that way in your Bibles. But even Paul is saying here, this was an ongoing issue for Christians, okay? And and the church at Corinth, the churches that James is writing to, it's always been an issue. Playing favorites, showing partiality. And so Paul is saying, and this is what James is saying today, that we're not supposed to do this. Like Paul is saying, he doesn't say who is Apollos or who is Paul. He says, what are they? What is Paul? What is their servants? That's what they are. They're nothing. It's God that deserves the honor and the glory. And he goes on to say, the one that plants and the one that waters are one. And so he's stressing unity amongst the brothers in Christ and that all the glory goes to God, not to any one of us. Okay, And so that's what James is going to stress in his letter today. So James is bringing this up, apparently because this was an issue. This was a problem for, this, for these churches. And it is still a major issue even amongst Christians today, right? So we know this happens all the time. And I'm going to get into this here in a minute, kind of some modern day examples of this. But we know that this is still, still an issue. So he goes from laying it out, he lays it out there, partiality. Okay, that's the issue. That's what we're talking about. And then in verses 2 through 3, he starts giving an example. Okay, so he gives the example of the rich man and the poor man that come into your assembly. Okay, that's another way of saying into your church. So for us, it would look like, you know, this on a Sunday morning. Now remember, they're meeting in homes. So the house, you know, smaller houses, not as much room. It would have been about like a home group on a Wednesday night. And so not much room, maybe kind of cramped. I don't know how many people they had meeting in these, you know, house churches. I don't know how big the houses were. But it's essentially like you're meeting in homes, seating is limited, uh, maybe some people are having to sit on the floor, or some are having to stand up and all of that. But you guys know, you've been to a home group, just about every house you go to is going to have a couch and maybe like a, a really nice recliner that like, you know, somebody likes to sit in and all that. So at home group on Wednesday night, what happens after we eat the meal, right? When it's time to kind of start working our way into the living room. Usually somebody's going to go in there and take that Bible and kind of sit it in like the really good recliner. You know, like that's how you go ahead and get your spot, right? They're essentially, this is what's happening here, is that he's given the example like, look, some guy walks into your, to your assembly, into your, your church house, into your church, 
looking like Tom Hanks off of Castaway, and you're telling the guy, like, okay, you can, you can sit on the floor, you can stand in the back if you want, or just, you can just hang out outside if that's okay. But then a guy looking like Tom Cruise walks in in a suit with a fresh shave and smelling good, and it's like, ooh, come here, Tom, you get the best seat in the house. Like, it's, it's, just, it's a horrible example, but you get what I'm saying, that they're showing preferential treatment to, to people based on appearances and based on wealth and money and things like that, external factors. And we're going to get into that more in just a moment. So after he gives his example, James jumps into, in verse 4, the heart of the matter. Okay, The root sin that's taking place in their hearts that's working its way out and showing itself impartiality. What's, what's really going on in the heart and in the mind that, that leads to this? So look at verse 4. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Again, some translations say evil motives. So the, the partiality, okay, the, the favoritism, treating people differently, was the outworking, again, of something something deeper that was going on inside their hearts. The root sin was that they were judging others. They're they're judging other people. They're judging their brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're not even judging them according to God's standard. They're judging them according to their own standard that they have set for who's worthy and who's not, who's good and who's bad, right? They're basing it on things like wealth and clothing and external stuff. That's what's going on in the heart here. And James recognizes this. And he says, look, you are, you're creating distinctions and you're judging for yourselves between these people. And what happens is, the result of this is you begin to make what he calls distinctions. Another way of saying this is, is separations. You start to make separations in your own mind. When you start to look at people and look at external things and you say, he dresses really nice and he dresses really shabby, And so I'm automatically going to divide in my mind who's worthy, who's not, who's good, who's bad, rich and poor. You start to separate. And now because you've separated these people into two different groups, you start to treat them differently and treat them accordingly in your own mind. And and, and it plays itself out in the way you act because of what's now taking place in your heart. This is the very same sin that Adam and Eve fell into. They tried to play God. Right? They, they wanted to be like God. And that's what James's audience, it's what we do too when we start to judge people. We know that we are not to judge. We can judge a tree by its fruit, absolutely. That's according to God's Word. But we are not to cast judgment on others. We are not to make distinctions and, and determine some to be worthy and some to be unworthy. And that's what these people were doing. James fully understood this. And this is why it mattered so much to him. This is why he's placing such high importance on this. is because he understands what is at stake. You see, James fully understood that by people doing this, by, by just looking at external superficial things and making distinctions and judging people and starting to treat people differently, that they were in grave danger of jeopardizing the unity of the church. Christ called His church to be one body with many members, each one different, serving a different purpose, but unified as one body. And James understood that what you were doing is you're taking all those different parts and you're separating them out as if they don't belong together. And this is a very, very dangerous thing for the church, or else he wouldn't have have even written on it. And so... Today, the big point that I want to make to you all in looking at this, my big idea for you, is that we maintain unity in the church through impartial love for one another. Okay, We maintain unity amongst ourselves, amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, through an impartial love for one another. We can't play favorites. We can't begin to judge amongst ourselves, who's worthy of my time and attention and love and who's not. Anyone in this room or any other church across this country that has been 
saved by the grace of God and a brother and sister in Christ is worthy of our love and affection. We don't get to decide who those people are. Amen? Okay, so let's keep moving. The, the external things that they were looking at here in this text was wealth and money and clothes, okay? Pretty easy stuff to notice. So I told you earlier that we'd talk about this. This happens even still today in churches. So great example. You see a guy, big beard, flannel, boots, drives a truck, likes to hunt and fish. Must be a man, right? He's man's man. He's manly. But <laughs> I almost did the Tim the Tool Man Taylor grunt thing. But, but you have no idea whether that man teaches his children. You don't know whether that man loves his wife the way he's commanded to, the way Jesus loved the church. You don't know what that man does in his free time when he's alone. But you see that man and you start to make judgments, right? Now, the, the flip side of that coin, that same guy, beard, flannel, boots, drives a truck, blue-collar job, you might look at him and say, well, he's got to be just a dumb redneck, right? He might be one of the greatest theologians you've ever met in your life, <laughs> and you have no idea. And so the point I'm making is that we still do this now. We, we do this all the time. We see people, and we just automatically, and it's just instinct. We make assumptions about them. You know, they must be X, Y, Z or fit into whatever category. And so they were doing this too in these churches that James is writing to. And when we do this, as we've been talking about so far, it causes divisions amongst God's people. It allows our, our mind and our thoughts now to start to affect our actions and the way that we treat people. We begin to become judges. We begin to cast judgment. We begin to... to act differently around those people. Maybe there's someone that you in your mind have deemed worthy, and so on a Sunday morning, even in here, you run over and shake that hand, and you want to talk for five minutes to that person, but then there's another person right beside that that you hadn't even said hello to today. Why? Are they not both bought and paid for by the blood of Christ? Are they not both worthy in God's eyes? And so we do this. We don't do it on purpose a lot of times. It's just becoming grand in us. Now, following James's progression through this, right? So he gives them the issue, partiality. He gives them the example. He gets to the root cause here, what's happening in their hearts. And then he begins to support what he's telling them, okay? Some scriptural support. In verses 5 through 7, he starts to point out to them, look, this is not how God operates, Okay, this is not how God does things when you're doing this, when you're treating the rich man better than the poor man. This isn't, this isn't normal for, for God, okay? The home group curriculum worded it like this. It is not in sync with God's character, with who he is as creator. And so when we, when we begin to do this, we are now acting in opposition to who God is, okay? That's important to remember. Do you remember the story in 1 Samuel when... Um, Saul was king, and God has decided he's going to choose a new king, right? And who was that? Who was the guy that came after Saul? David. Okay, so you remember David was just a boy, and God sends Samuel to Jesse's house. That's David's dad. Goes to Jesse's house and tells him, you're going to anoint a new king, okay? But he doesn't tell him who it is, right? He doesn't say, hey, it's David. Go find David. He just says, it's going to be one of Jesse's sons, and you'll know him. And so he gets there. And right off the bat, he starts to see some of Jesse's oldest sons. And I'm not sure if it was his absolute oldest, but one of them's name was Eliab. And it says that when Samuel saw him, he just knew by his stature and his build, I mean, he's handsome, he's tall, he's strong, all that. He knew, he's like, this has got to be the guy. I mean, look at this guy, you know? I mean, he's over there just, he's, he's living it up. This is the dude for sure. This is what God says, though, in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks on the heart of man. And that's why God loves the poor. And that's what James gets into in these following verses. In verses 5 through 7, 
we see that God has chosen those who are poor to be rich in faith. Okay, now, multiple verses throughout Scripture support this. This was one of the exercises we did in home groups this week, was to look up Old Testament verses that support this idea that God favors the poor. Okay? Tons of verses. Psalm 10, 12. Psalm 41, 1 through 2. Proverbs 22, 22. I, I had all these listed. I was going to read them, but it's going to take too long. But there's a lot of them. Okay? There's a lot of them in there. Um, Matthew Henry, in his commentary, even says this about you know what James is telling his readers is that those whom you have such a low opinion of are those whom God has made heirs of the kingdom. They are princes and princesses. They are going to inherit the kingdom, and those are the ones that you're treating like dirt. Now, we know that poor can mean impoverished, no money, but it doesn't always just mean financially. It also means those who are helpless. I love the way the home group guides worded it. It said it's those who are helpless to whom God shows special concern. Those who are marked by a recognition that they cannot help themselves. And throughout Scripture, poverty tends toward that kind of humility more than wealth does. Okay, And in the same way, sickness tends toward that kind of humility more than health does. So, so don't miss this. I know I was reading a, a quote, but the point is this, that that kind of humility, that being humble, knowing that you can't help yourself, that happens more times than not when we're sick, not when we're healthy, right? It's when we're sick and we're desperate and we're at our ropes in and we're crying out to God for help that we're, we're humble and we recognize how powerful He is and how helpless we are. And likewise, maybe it's not sickness and health. Maybe it is money. Maybe it's like, man, I don't have a dime left to my name. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. God, I need some help. It's then that we cry out to God, right? It's never when we're rich. And so the point here is that those going through trials, tribulations, going through, through tough times usually tend to lean more toward that sort of humility and being poor in spirit. Now, that's not an absolute hard, fast rule, right? We, we know that not every poor person loves the Lord and is showing humility toward God, right? We know that not every rich person is living in sin saying, oh, I got this, I don't need God. We, we know that's not always the case, but typically that's how these things work. And that's why Jesus taught that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. Because with great money and great riches comes great pride and arrogance and this, this thought that I don't really need God. I'm doing okay. And so we have to be very careful with these things. But we know that it's the poor that God shows special favor to. Now, I want to I want to point this out. And again, the home group curriculum, I'm, I'm kind of reading through that this week. I'm reading through this text and I'm seeing all these connections. It did a great job of pointing this out. Being poor, okay, being poor, whether monetarily or poor in spirit or whatever, does not mean that you automatically go to heaven. Okay, that, that's not the prerequisite to go to heaven, is I need to be poor. In verse 5, we see that He has promised the kingdom to those who love Him. Okay, it says, Listen, my beloved brethren, did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him? So we know that typically the poor are rich in faith, but just because you're poor doesn't mean, yep, your ticket's punched. It's those who love the Lord that will inherit the kingdom. God shows a special concern for those who are helpless and those who cry out to Him and those who need Him, but it is only those who put their total and complete faith, hope, and trust in God that will inherit the kingdom of God. That is the prerequisite. That is the only thing you bring to the table is an understanding that all I bring into this situation is sin. I'm just a sinner and I need a Savior. And so I'm asking God to save me. All right? That's, that's all. And so if you do that, if you understand that you are separated from God because of your sin, that you cannot save yourself, and that you are a sinner... Romans 3.23 tells us this, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you understand that, that you, you look, you can't 
earn your way into heaven. You're not going to work your way into heaven. You're not good enough. You understand that. Then you can cast your cares on the Lord and you say, Lord, forgive me. I repent in dust and ashes. Please save my soul. Then, then you can be saved. You've put all confidence in Him and not yourself. That is how we inherit the kingdom of God. It's not just by being poor or being rich or being ugly or pretty or any of that stuff. It's total dependence on the Lord. It's repent and believe is what His Word teaches. So that's a word on the poor. Now, the rich, um, if being poor usually lends itself toward being humble in spirit, then like we've talked about, being rich most of the time can lend toward being a bit arrogant and not dependent on God. So he, James says a couple of things here about the rich. He says, look, do you guys not understand that, that it's the poor that God's chosen to inherit the kingdom and the rich over here are the ones who oppose you, they drag you to court, and they blaspheme Jesus. So back then, um, this was a pretty interesting find when I was studying for this, the ESV study Bible says it like this. It's frequently recorded in the Old Testament. The wealthy would use the court system to steal from the poor. So back then, you had not only people like these Pharisees that are running around taking advantage of people, you know, living this lavish lifestyle and all that, but the rich of that time used the court systems to manipulate people and steal land and titles and money from poor all the time. They manipulated the system. And so James is telling them, look, these rich people are walking into your church and you're seeing all the flashy gold rings and all of that. And you're like, ooh, he must be special. Come sit here. Those are the very people that are oppressing you. Those are the people that are opposed to God. Do you not see this? This is completely backwards. God has chosen the poor. The rich will be judged. You're choosing the rich and you're disregarding the poor. You've got it completely backwards. And then he gets to verse 8. James 2, verses 8 through 9 say, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture that says, You shall not love, or you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So if you do that, if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Let's think about this for a minute. If you really fulfill the royal law, what is the royal law? Have you, thought, have you ever thought about that? I kind of glanced over it when I was reading through this. Let's, let's talk about that for a moment. If something's the royal something, what does that... If this is the royal pulpit, that means it belongs to the king, right? If this is the royal laptop, it's the king's laptop. And so the royal law is the king's law. Well, who's the king? Jesus. So the royal law is Jesus' law. But wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Jesus came to fulfill the law, not create new ones. Well, what did we just talk about in Sunday school this morning? Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. There's a second that is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. That is the king's law. That is the royal law, to love God and love others. Jesus himself taught that to love your neighbor is just as important as your love for the Lord, and that every other law, all of it depends on your ability to do this. It can all be summed up in these two laws, love God and love your neighbor. So if you break this law, you are becoming a transgressor and you're breaking all the laws. And that's the exercise we did this morning. We see that in breaking these laws, we break all of them. That's how important this lesson was for these Christians that James is writing to. That is what's at stake when it comes to loving our brothers and sisters in Christ without partiality. And did you know, this isn't the only verse in Scripture that says all the law and the prophets depend on that verse. There's another one. Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 12 says this, 
Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's known as the golden rule. You've all heard that your whole lives, right? That used to be posted in schools when I was growing up. So you've got the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself. Then you've got the golden rule, do to others the way you want to be treated. Those two things, all the law, all the prophets depend on those two things. Love God and love people. And if you're not doing that, you're breaking them all. You're condemning yourself. You're going to jeopardize the unity in the church. It all hinges on this. 1 John 4.20 says, If anyone says that I love God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he is, who he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. So you can't say, well, I love, I love the Lord, I just don't like His church. I love God, I like to spend time with Him, I just don't like going to church, I don't like Christians. It doesn't work that way. We've, I've, I've heard this example, I know I've used this example so many times, I'm going to use it again, it's too good not to use it. If, if I invited some of you to dinner at my house, I said, hey, me and Sherry want to have you guys over for dinner, we'd love to hang out and play some board games and just have a great time. And I said, hey, hey Dylan, I'm going to invite you guys over to play board games. And Sorry, Ashley, I'm not picking on you. Hey, Dylan, come over. I'm going to invite you guys over. But, but if it's cool with you, man, like, look, could you just come by yourself? Just leave her at the house. Would that be okay? Like, you know, no, just, you, know you know what I mean. Would that be okay? Dylan's going to be like, uh, no. <laughs> That's my wife. Uh, I love my wife. We are one. Like, you know, we're a package deal. And so you can't say that you love Jesus, but you hate his bride the church that he gave his life for. That's not how it works. It's against his character. It's against Scripture itself. You can't say you love God and hate your neighbor. It's not true. And so this is a huge, huge deal for these churches. This is a a big deal for all Christians back then, and this is why James is taking the time to address this issue in these churches, and it still applies to us today. This, look, I get it. This is not easy to do, okay? Doing church is messy. People are messy. There's a whole room full of sinners in here right now, okay? And all, all of you have your own baggage and met, trust me, I get to see and hear about a lot of that. And that's a whole side of ministry that I did not even look forward to and didn't know that was part of it. But it is, and I, you know what? I'm happy to be right in the middle of it with you. It, it's tough at times. But we all have that. We all have that junk. And it is not easy to love people. People are hard. People can be really hard to love. And there's some people, especially. Have you ever heard that? Like a person's just hard to love? Like some people are annoying. They're just not fun to be around, right? They're just not. It's it's not always easy. But, and quite honestly, The way some people treat you, they don't deserve to be loved. But real Christian brotherly love covers a multitude of offenses. Real love overlooks all of that. Look, it's that that kind of love that is the only reason a marriage can work, right? I love someone so much that I, I care about them more than my own self. And I'm willing to overlook those things because I know I'm not perfect either. It's only that kind of love that can make this work. Romans 5.8 says, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't tell us, go clean yourself up first and then I might think about giving my son for you. God loved us so much, He sent His only Son while we were still sinners to die for us. I thank God. I thank God that He loved me even when I didn't deserve to be loved. Can you imagine? But yet we treat people like they have to earn our love. If we are to love as Christ loves, that means we love people even when, even when they don't deserve it. Even when it's really hard to love them. When they're pushing every button you've got, you love them anyway. 
If you have never experienced what I'm talking about, if you don't know that kind of love, and, I, and look, I get it. You know, earthly relationships, our, our marriages, our relationships with our parents or our kids or siblings can be really difficult. And maybe you've never experienced that kind of love inside a earthly relationship. But that kind of love that God shows us is available to everyone that would call upon the name of the Lord. And if you have never experienced that, I invite you to experience that today. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, all who are burdened, I will give you rest. He invites you to bring all of that. You know, we talked about being poor earlier, and I I told you guys, that's not just always money. Like, Jesus invites you with all that mess, all that poorness you carry around, everything you've got going on to come to him and lay it all at his feet. And he will love you despite it all. He already has. He invites you to come to that. And when you do, when you do what I explained earlier and you say, look, Lord, I, I've got a lot of sin that I'm carrying around and I want to lay it at your feet. I want to trust in you. I want to put my faith in you. Please save me. When you do that, you get to experience the love that only a Savior can offer you. A selfless, self-sacrificing love like none other. And I invite you to that today. Repent and believe the gospel and experience that kind of love that only Jesus can offer you. And then do your best the rest of your life to love other people like that. That's the standard, right? That's the standard by which we treat other people, not our own hearts and minds as judges. He ends, James ends this text with some really good practical instruction. In verse 12, he says, So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So as those who have received, happily, happily, eagerly received God's grace and God's mercy, we should gladly extend that to other people, right? We shouldn't take, be willing to take all that grace and mercy from the Lord and say, well, thank you, God, I, I needed this and you know, I, I deserved your mercy and your grace, but I'm not going to show that to other people. We don't get to do that. We should be willing to extend that same love, that same mercy and grace to everyone. And we can do this. This is possible. This this type of what's called agape love is possible, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. It cannot be done apart from Him. And so again, I'm going to plea with you today, if you've never given your life to the Lord to do that, you will never know this kind of love and you will never be able to give this kind of love apart from the Holy Spirit enabling you to do that. You might love your spouse, but you'll never love your spouse the way you were meant to if you are not a Christian. It's not possible. Again, James wrote this. This was an issue. He wanted to protect the unity of the church. He wanted to show them you are one body, united together under the blood of Christ, and you have to love one another. If you don't, it's all gonna, it's gonna disrupt the unity. And look, you guys know. Satan is out to destroy us any way he can. Scripture tells us that he prowls around like a lion looking for those he can destroy. He would happily do that from within. Try to destroy the church from within. Right? We have to do what we can, everything we can, to make sure we are guarding our own hearts and our own minds and that we are loving one another in this kind of way if we want to protect the unity of this church. You guys have done an amazing job of this over the last several weeks, over the last month of coming together as a unified body of believers and just showing so much love and support to Kyle and Patricia, Sherry and I, the other elders as they lead as as we're out. You guys have done a great job of this. I'm not here today scolding you. I'm here to praise you for doing such an amazing job at this. But don't let your guard down. Don't ever start thinking that you've got it figured out and that we're good and we can just kind of roll on. This is something we have to step into every single day. 
We have to make a, a conscious decision every day that I'm going to wake up today and love people the way God loves me, even if they don't deserve it. I'm going to go out of my way to love people well today. And I want to encourage you in that. Now, one last thing, Galatians 3, 26 through 29, we read in Sunday school this morning. I, I had to add it. We're in there in Sunday school, and I'm like, this is, I'm talking about this today. It says this, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you, of many, as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's not slave or free. There's not male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you were Christ's, then you were Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I want to encourage you in that today. We are unified as a body of believers. We don't make distinctions among ourselves that some are worthy of my time and attention and love and some are not. We love one another equally and we love one another with all we have. And so he ends this with two instructions to his readers. He says, speak as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. If I expect God to show me mercy and grace on the day of judgment because I've put my faith in Christ, I need to show other Christians that same mercy and grace every day. Okay, so that's your application and your instruction today. Leave this place today and go out and treat other people the way you want to be treated. Love them with brotherly love, knowing that one day, if I expect to stand before God and be forgiven, I better be willing to forgive other people. Love people in that kind of way. Let your speech be marked with love and grace toward people that you talk to. Let your actions reflect the love of Christ and prove the faith that you claim to have in Him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I love you. And God, I am so grateful, Lord, for your word. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to read it and to see situations like this in James where we see issues going on in the church and we hear some practical instruction and just things that we need to still hear today, things that we need to be able to apply to our lives. And God, I'm so grateful, so grateful that you sent your son Jesus to die for me when I did not deserve it. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for your grace and your mercy in my life. I pray, God, that you help every one of us to love others the way you love us. To not look on others with judgment, to not begin to make distinctions in our minds, but to treat all equally, to see them as a, a, a bought and paid for brother and sister in Christ, and to love them that way. God, please give us the ability to do this. Empower us to do this through your Holy Spirit. And for anyone in this place that doesn't know you, I pray that through the Holy Spirit, you would just draw them and convict them you would show them their own sin and help them to see their great need for a Savior. We praise you this morning, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.